This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Starting today's show is Dan O'Brien, K-State Grain Economist, and Guy Allen, the Senior Economist at the IGP Institute, to discuss domestic and international grain markets. The pair converse about the various Kansas commodities, as well as what macro issues are currently being experienced and crop planting progress. Chip Redmond, K-State Meteorologist, ends the shows for this week with a weather update. Chip talks about the different weather people in Kansas have been experiencing and what can be expected in the coming weeks. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Friday show talking about the grain market both domestically and internationally. And then to talk about it, we're joined by K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien and the senior economist at the IGP Institute here at K-State, Guy Allen. Dan, Guy, thank you both so much for taking the time to join us today. Thanks for having us. Dan, kicking off our conversation, looking at the Kansas markets for wheat. There's been a lot happening the last week, uh, and of course, that's that's brought us to where we're at in the grain futures. That from where we were on uh, Friday of last week, when the USGA came out with their reports, we've seen some movement in, in the futures markets. Uh, some in some of these commodities, a little, little bit of narrowing in basis on on the feed grains. Guy and I later on talk about some underlying factors on that. Then, of course, the Kansas wheat tour has uh, happened this week. New information to come on. I think a uh, guy's going to lead out on that. Uh, so when you look at where thing, where markets closed on Thursday, uh, yesterday, July corn, 457 is down five cents, but really we've we just, we've been trading around uh, in the last few days. We, again, about a week ago, we were about, about 457, 455. We traded up to about just about 470 or so at the very, very top. Now back down, closed again at at uh, that 457. If anything, uh, we're watching new crop bids as much as anything. So D's corn closed yesterday at 481, had gotten into the 490s uh, in the in the last several days, but traded back down uh, again following from report issues. Uh, November soybeans traded now down below $12 to 1199 had been. A bit higher than that uh, in this last week. July actually closed a little bit higher at uh, twelve sixteen and a quarter, up two cents. Uh, again, whereas November was down to so. And really, July wheat has has been more volatile this week, uh, mainly with news that anticipation was going to come out of the Kansas wheat tour and and international factors. So we had seen that the July contract, the harvest contract for Kansas City. Hard red winter wheat, uh, or Kansas hard red winter wheat, traded on the CME now at 6.73 and a quarter, down one and three quarter cents yesterday. Generally, pretty strong carry in those markets, six seven cents all the way out to March of 2025, and that that's a market that if you have carry like that, you generally you see uh, the incentive being given to store. You'll hold on to it. At least that's how we normally interpret it, uh, that type of positive carry in, in the markets. would say in the cash markets, uh, we still see ethanol plant bids for Kansas for corn at uh, about 498 and, and a half, just under five. And the next highest state comes in with uh, Nebraska at about 470. In Iowa, they're 463, 461, less than that everywhere else. So our Western Corn Belt location uh, is uh, giving us better bids. There's transportation issues, some scarcity of supply issues that could come into play. Speaking of scarcity of supply, we've seen on some of these Kansas locations for corn, the cash bids move a bit higher. So now we're up to, at the elevators, a bid of 30 over for uh, for corn, it, that's the top bid in Southwest Kansas for at 487. Also positive, uh, 11 over in, in Colby, and we had been even or a little bit below that uh, over the last month or so. Uh, even in some other areas, weakest actually in Salina and Hutchinson, right through the central part of the state. Grain sorghum bids all really uh, for most of the state uh, looking pretty strong. Cash bids. 20 over at 477 at, at Salina export bid area. That's uh, really leading this, leading the state. Soybean bids, 
really pretty variable. The strongest bid by far in Topeka in the eastern part of the state at 2,500, everything else at mm-hmm. at least 75, 65, 75 under or less. And then, of course, with uh, impending, well, in, impending in uh, July wheat harvest and it's having come out of the Kansas wheat tour, seeing a well, we have cash bids at uh, about 623, 658 thereabouts, but new crop bids. They are over six dollars, but the strongest of them is six forty three in Topeka, six thirty eight Salina, six thirty eight in Hutchinson, and six twenty three, six thirteen thereabouts elsewhere around the state. So we do have uh, six dollar bids for cash, but cost of production, depending on really uh, if there's a fallow period involved farther out to the west or not, uh, you know we're we're covering direct cost production for sure, but I guess the total amount of cost that goes into the land side is really a determinant, as, as well as the coverage of fallow where we have some non-cropped acres that determine what that final cost of production production is. So at these prices, we're, we're surely covering direct costs in the west part of the state, but are probably struggling to cover total economic costs uh, in those more fallow prone areas. And Guy, can you share with us a little bit about some of those numbers that came from the Kansas Wheat Tour? Yeah, here this afternoon, uh, the Kansas Wheat Tour concluded their three-day tour after visiting uh, 449 fields across the state. Uh, And they came together to put some final numbers on their their estimates, which were quite optimistic. They came in at uh, 46 and a half bushels per acre. That came in at about just over 290 million bushels a week. That's a 55% increase from last year. Just to compare that to last week's USDA numbers, on May 1st, they had uh, Kansas wheat crop forecasted at 268 million bushels. So they came in, uh, you know, just over 20 million, uh, 22 million bushels, a bit better than the USDA number. So USDA number was up 33% from last year. So in a few more weeks, we'll kind of see how that comes to town. It's good to see uh, the crop in better conditions than it has been the last few years. Now the challenge is going to be to uh, find some markets, particularly export markets for this wheat. And on that uh on the wheat tour, I think the first day was about a 49 and a half bushel average, and they were more northern, northern Kansas, then swung through the, the tougher part of the state down southwest and, and over in the south central second day. And I think the average there was either 42 or 44 bushels. So they ended up at 46. So that what they had seen the last day must have ended up somewhere about in the middle uh, yeah. by, by the time they brought all that together. And, and uh, yeah, it's sure a lot better situation that but just depends where you're at in the state. There's a lot of spotty fields, some rough looking fields that didn't happen to catch moisture. Uh, as you go down the Garden City area, you, you drive right by them. You know, you, they, they've, they've turned brown. So uh, although the overall average is a little bit better, there's still quite a few people that depending on where they were at in the state, if they happen to catch rain or not, that uh, things still look pretty rough for them. What are we seeing on the international side of things for wheat? It's a bit mixed. Uh, interesting. Uh... USDA had expected Russia to uh, produce above average crop this year. It would be potentially the third consecutive record wheat crop. However, we have seen some fairly cold, unseasonably uh, frost and cold weather come through uh, a number of their growing areas. So it's put a big question on that. The thing I'm always a bit cautious of, a good number of years ago, we had a late May cold snap in Kansas, and they ended up having a record hard red winter wheat crop. So wheat's pretty resilient, but we'll see how that turns out. And Russia and that Black Sea area is pretty key, one of our strongest export competitors. Looking at China, China, their USDA forecast came in at about a record 140 million metric tons this year, which is a new high for China. They have received some fairly good uh, growing conditions across most of that country this year. Just to our immediate north, uh, Canada's production uh, was up 6% to uh, 34 million metric tons. Conditions up there are not too dissimilar from Kansas and western Kansas, with a bit more optimistic on their production. And then India. India is expecting uh, record levels of wheat production this year at 114 million metric tons. That's up 3%. And you look at China and India, they're the two biggest wheat producers in the world. So I think uh, India had gotten their uh, ending stocks down this year to historically fairly tight levels. So they needed a bit of an increase there, but it's sort of going to throw a damper on uh, on our export potential to uh, China particularly, but I think remain a bit optimistic. Uh, The Russians and the Aussies won't be quite so hard to compete against this coming year. I would add in that uh, if you look at the rate 
the pace of U.S. wheat exports. We're still trailing in this marketing year with about three full weeks left, in essence, kind of aiming for the June report. And the marketing year ending May 31st, we're trailing some guy. I would not be surprised that unless we come through at the end and we, we add a whole bunch of uh, other wheat products uh, on a equivalent basis back into that wheat number that will probably end up with, uh, we could very well end up with lower wheat exports on the USDA domestic supply demand balance sheet and add a little bit more to the ending stocks for this 23-24 marketing year, making things look that much rougher in terms of uh, beginning stocks for the supply demand balances. Yeah. So I to just add in again, we came out of that May report. We have these issues we're wrestling with. Still, the overall world wheat supply demand numbers, stocks to use, percent stocks to use for the world with China included, 31.6% haven't been below. We, we haven't been that low since about 2007, 2008. And uh, down, we're down below 20% stocks to use, uh, 18.6% projected for the next year. So projected to tighten up even more. So uh, Shelby, it's the same, the same uh, conundrum we've had. Gosh, uh, we see the situations kind of poor for U.S. wheat exports, but gracious, we're, we're getting tighter and tighter and tighter when it comes to uh, world wheat balances. And someday this the collision of these different forces will lead to some volatility in prices. Dan, did you have the numbers there for uh, the major exporters, less China or the, the major yeah. exporters? Because that's that's a fairly tight number, I think, coming at the end of this year, isn't it? I don't have it quantified, but but yes. well, that, that's right. Uh, major exporters like minus China show about the same situation as the world minus China, really, in terms yes. of just tight, tight, tight. Yes. We're cutting to a short break now on agriculture today, but stick around because once we come back from the break, we'll once again be joined by Dan O'Brien and Guy Allen as we continue our domestic and international grain market <clears throat> conversation. You're tuned back into Agriculture Today, and we continue our Friday show and conversation with Dan O'Brien and Guy Allen on the international and domestic grain market. We're continuing our conversation now by talking about corn and grain sorghum. So the USDA came out with their projection for 2023-24, the first in the in terms of the actual WASDE report. They projected, but they used the June numbers, about 90 million acres of corn planted, uh, estimate of about, figures out about 82 harvested, 181 bushels an acre, 14.86 billion bushels, which by the way, is it's not 15 billion bushels. So they're starting out projecting less than 15 billion bushels. Ending stocks down to 2.1 billion, stocks use 14.2%. That is sharply less than what the first numbers were in February. Uh, if you plug in the record high that we've had on the same acres, 177.3 bushels per acre in the U.S. this year, and that would be a record high yield. We're about 14.5, 14.6% billion bushels ending stocks at 1.8 billion guy, which is a surprise. That's that's where it would come. Stocks yeah. these 12.2%, 2% less. And if we get that, we won't be having 440 cash prices. <laughs> so I'm, I don't want to be too facetious on that. But Guy, what, what do you see uh, in, in the international side, particularly down South America? Well, not not necessarily a lot to add there. We still got the quandrum on the Brazilian corn. I'll let you expand on that in a second. But you know, overall, the world productions did come in slightly lower. I think the key numbers there is going to be the livestock feed demand, which is which there's a lot of debate, particularly in the on the beef side of things, on uh, with lower numbers on beef numbers, not only in the U.S. but but elsewhere in the world. That's going to erode a bit of that feed demand there as way as well. But it's keeping beef prices particularly fairly strong in that. The ethanol grind will be pretty consistent. Uh, not too many changes on that. So, and the other key one there in corn is going to be China. The thing that keeps me optimistic about Chinese demand is uh, we saw a good demand for uh, soybean meal into China, which that will equate to uh, strong corn demand as well. And that goes into the compound feeders there. 
for corn production in South America. The USDA did lower their numbers. There's still this disagreement, sharp disagreement between what they're saying in country for their crops and as opposed to what the USDA said. Basically, uh, for Brazil, the USDA projected 122 million metric tons uh, in country. Conab, about 111. Uh, another independent came out about 112 or so. So sharp differential. Rosario Exchange in Argentina projected about 47 and a half million metric tons. The USDA projected 53. So uh, information came out of uh, our colleagues uh, out of their shop at uh, University of Illinois saying that the difference comes down to how you figure ending stocks. So I, I guess we'll see. The, the market's trading off the USDA numbers. We'll see where it all goes at the end. Just turning to sorghum. Sorghum, uh, they had global sorghum production higher, uh, U.S. being the biggest part of that. It was up uh, 1.8 million metric tons. However, they also are fairly optimistic. Sorghum exports continue to see good demand for sorghum coming out of China. That's going to keep sorghum priced at a pretty good premium to corn, I think, all the way through next marketing year there as well. With the weather we're having against in Kansas with a bit of moisture in that, that should bode well for sorghum production, with Kansas being the largest sorghum state. And I think uh, prices for grain sorghums are going to continue to be uh, relatively strong. You mentioned import demand coming out of China for sorghum. It showed up, showing up for us, uh, strong current marketing, uh, old crop marketing year, uh, export numbers, a uh, strong week this last week at 5.5 million bushels of, of demand. We need a pace about 4.2 to, to get to that. And the USDA doubled down for their next marketing year. If, we, if we're, we're projecting 245 million million bushels this year, 260 next year. So I, I guess we probably hit that unless we get into some geopolitical conflict or who knows what. And wanting yes. to move on now to our next crop of soybeans. Soybean uh, demand coming out of China has been real strong here through April and May. We we'll continue to see uh, strong crush levels there in China. Disappointing thing is not a lot of it's coming out of the U.S. It continues to come come from South America and, and our other competitors on that. But it, it's good to see uh, a bit of res- resilience in, in the demand on that thing. Domestically, we're seeing uh, crush sort of back off a bit, but we have seen strong exports of uh, soybean meal as we set uh, record levels of monthly exports in, in the soybean meal. I know there was a lot of questions with this biodiesel situation. What are we going to do with all the meal? And we seem to have uh, found demand without dropping the price too much on, on the soybean meal situation. On the international side, I would add in some of the same issues, although not quite as extreme, are, are showing up uh, in terms of the Brazilian numbers. Again, USDA projected uh, for this marketing year 50 million metric tons in in that uh, May report. In country, they're about 149. So again, uh, there's there's something to be reconciled there. The Argentine number, uh, about 50 million metric tons, but with the caveat that hey, it's been raining quite a bit in on some of their fields, and they wonder about quality issues down in. In those southern areas. And on the uh, soybean domestic front, projected for new crop uh, 2024, 25 marketing year, USDA took the, again, the June numbers, 86 for planting intentions, 86 and a half million acres planted, just under that for harvested, plugged in 52 bushels an acre at or near record highs, 4.45 billion bushels, ending stocks, 445 million at 10.2% stocks to use. If you look back to the two, last two complete years, we averaged 49.6, 50.6 bushels per acre in the U.S. If you plug in 50, almost in the middle of that, and use all the same balance sheets, then you drop the production to 4.27, 4.28 billion bushels, ending stocks down to 274, so to 475, stocks used down to 6.3. So uh, we're on the edge again. So if, if, if we get 50 bushels an acre instead of 52, we're on, we're on that close on the edge. And if we don't get a record high yield, then we're looking at higher soybean prices than the 1120 that the USDA projected. Guy, wanting to round out our conversation today by talking about some different macro issues that are taking place and could impact the market. Yeah, one thing I always like to touch base on is the international freight. We saw the Baltic Dry Freight Index rally to above uh, 2,100 uh, points here late last week, indicating some higher cost of freight and transportation. On that, that's going to make 
originating countries that are afraid advantage those high destination markets in Asia a bit more competitive on that. So we'll we'll keep an eye on that. Part of that's also I think reflective of fairly good demand for dry bulk commodities, of which grains probably about a little less than twenty percent of that in in total. U.S. dollar has come down a bit in the last week. That's lending a bit of support to commodity prices off of its highs a couple of weeks ago. So that's lending a bit of support across the whole uh, grains complex. Just this morning then here on Thursday, we did see the S&P 500, the Dow, Jones Industrial Average, and the NASDAQ 100 post new uh, record highs. Since this morning, uh, it's backed off a bit this afternoon. Uh, a lot of these highs were put in on the speculation that the Fed may cut rates later this year. I remain a bit more pessimistic, I guess, than, than the market in that sense. While the Fed seems to be doing their job of getting their monetary policy under control, we see uh, fiscal policy continue to spend significant amount of money. And I think that's going to continue to add to, to inflationary pressures. A lot of what was driving today's thoughts on the stocks was uh, slowdowns in the economy, on a number of the the indicators, uh, unemployment fell. It was down 10,000 to 222, but it wasn't quite the as low as had expected. Housing starts rose uh, 5.7 percent, but still weaker than expected. So the economy's not uh, not quite as robust as maybe we thought, which might let the Fed. Uh, lower the interest rates there. However, being an election year, I think the Fed will be a bit reserved to uh, do anything that may appear to be political prior to the election in November. So we'll we'll sort of wait and see, but I'm a bit pessimistic. We're going to see a drop in interest rates before the end of the year. And Dan, I'm going to hand it back to you for just one last thought of, could you give us a rundown of what the crop progress report shows? We've been seeing some corn dated May the 5th. Again, report came out on the 6th. U.S. corn, 36% planted, 39% on uh, normal. Kansas running ahead, we're at 51% as as of that date. And now, you know, we've had some good days since that time. So we're sharply ahead of that now. So uh, at emergence, uh, the last set of numbers on May the 5th, we were at 29 and here we're 15, 16. So we're, we're doing well in terms of that. Soybean plantings, in, in the U.S., running also running ahead of, ahead of pace, no doubt we're still there. Kansas numbers, uh, again, a week or so ago, were at 22%, so we're farther ahead of that for right now. Again, if you drive out in the country, you you see a lot of activity going on where it's not too wet. So anyway, overall, uh, we see sorghum, uh, of course, starting later for plantings, uh, just barely starting a couple weeks ago, no, no doubt. Uh, as we are, we're to mid-May now, there'll be some going after that as well. So where are we at? I, generally, we're underway. We have uh, sun shining, some rains that had come. Uh, as things dry up enough, we'll be going forward on that. And so, so far, planning progress isn't our biggest issue. I think it's getting getting the crop in and, and really the looming question that's out there of, of what happens uh, with uh, the forecast of La Nina returning out there in July, August, September. What will that do? to our growing conditions. So it's shaping up uh, just as you and I thought, Shelby, that, gosh, we'll get the crop in, et cetera, and uh, get get it underway and then see what the weather brings for the rest of the growing season. That was K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien and the senior economist at the IGP Institute, Guy Allen. We're cutting to a short break now on agriculture today, but stick around because we have more for you ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we conclude our Friday show with a weather update. And as always, we're joined by K-State meteorologist Chip Redmond. Chip, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Chip, what have we been seeing this past week? We've had a fair amount of moisture for most of the state, thankfully. It hasn't been heavy in all places, uh, but much needed rainfall um, in areas where they needed it, especially in portions of southwest and, and south central Kansas. But uh, we also saw continued moisture in the east who continue to be the lucky winners, which climatology favors that, that they continue to see rainfall. And some of the rain came down pretty heavy. Uh, we had some totals exceeding multiple inches when we get out into eastern Kansas. And then when we look further to the west, rainfall was much more sporadic in nature. The lowest areas that we saw was southwest Kansas that only saw about a quarter inch of rain. 
we need rainfall this time of year. We got crops coming up. Uh, we need to sustain crops. And I know droughts already had a pretty substantial toll on some of them. Unfortunately, that probably can't be reversed to this point. But now we need to think about the next crops in the corn and, and soybeans and sorghum that are, that are starting to go in the ground now. Um, and then we also have to think about water storage. And, and we've had some good amounts of water runoff that uh, we still want soaking the ground, but we need we need to up those ponds and lakes. And so that's starting to happen now, finally, to some extremes in a couple of localized areas like around the Tuttle Lake and, and Milford. But further west, we need more rainfall to continue that progress. And so have we seen changes in the drought monitor? Yeah, so the drought monitor cutoff was Tuesday morning, and we had precipitation to that point for most of the state that helped stave off big substantial degradation in drought monitor. But still about 50% of the state is in moderate or worse drought. And we still have severe drought for most of southwest and south central. And then this week, we had the first reintroduction of extreme drought in the state. It's a small little area in northwest Pawnee County and that kind of that four-county area of Rush, Ness, and, and Hodgman. But that's the first time since December we've seen extreme drought. And just a sign that things are still worsening, especially in the southwest and south central. And hopefully that's not a sign of what's to come because once we establish substantial dryness in that area, it's going to be hard to reverse that. What can we be expecting as we look forward for this weekend? Yeah, as you look forward this weekend, precipitation is going to taper off, which for some folks, especially in the east, is probably much needed. But that's unfortunate for folks out west. We'll see temperatures warm up as a result. More high pressure, drier air moves in. Then starting on Sunday, it looks like we have another low pressure system that's going to develop east of the Rockies. That push a dry line in the state. No, that dry line will bring severe weather most likely for central part of the state. And then as we get into Monday, that severe weather will likely expand into the eastern part of the state. That will be another chance of precipitation. But it'll have, unfortunately, the the typical May hazards of severe weather with everything possible on on the board right now. But uh, as you get later on into next week, we see the potential for thunderstorms continuing. It's not quite sure where they will, but the pattern seems to be much more favorable going into the end of May, early June to be still conducive for severe weather. And then um, more isolated areas of heavy rain, not as much widespread stuff as we've seen. Is there going to be a cutoff for this potential severe weather as we look forward? Yes. The new Climate Prediction Center outlooks came out on Thursday morning, and they highlighted that eastern Kansas is going to be favored for continued moisture into early June. That'll be tied with our severe weather. But western Kansas is still going to be hit and miss and and less likely to see widespread moisture. And so they expect drier than normal conditions there. And then the expansion of drought, unfortunately, as we get into the summer months is favored. We get into the later into the summer, July, August, September timeframe, we see the whole state start to be favored for below normal precipitation, and we see drought expansion favored. Chip, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and give us our weather update. Yep, let's keep this rain coming. That was Kansas State University meteorologist Chip Redmond. If you'd like to check out more about the weather, you can do so by going to K-State's Mesonet website. You can find that by going to www.mesonet.ksu.edu. That is www.mesonet.ksu.edu. That's all we have for you today on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you on Monday. Monday.